Yeah, this nigga is dead to me. So, what exactly is it about black folks and the prospect of making millions, if not billions of dollars, that will cause so many of us to line up to sell our souls to the highest bidder? I mean, maybe the fact that white folks have been doing that with our bodies for about four centuries or so is something of a precedent, but that's not my point. At what point do we as a people realize that there is no such thing as a benevolent billionaire? Maybe around the same point that we realize that an empty country crop tub is not tubbleware, but I digress. From Rihanna to Hove to Ye, the black billionaire class has become something of a pseudo-inspirational tale to the point that this class of super elite melanated moguls has become our century's equivalent of W.E.B. Du Bois' talented 10th. And if you are one of those 8 in 10 self-identified leftists who has some version of a Marx meme as your profile picture but couldn't pick the boys out of a lineup of random black bald dudes from the early 20th century, the talented 10th is basically Lenin's vanguard, but for black people and a lot less pew pew stabby stabby. For those of you who mainly watch this channel for the media analysis and pretty much nothing else, or for those of you who like me have just gotten so old and jaded at this point that any and all political theory just sounds like a bunch of old dudes circle jerking their egos off, the Boyce's talented 10th is the term that he used for the one in 10 black men who had the capacity to be leaders in our community. So people like me and and that's it, really. The boys believed that it was imperative for these men to receive a classical college education as opposed to the more industrial trade-focused education that people like Booker T. Washington espoused in order for those men to lead black people out of second-class citizenry. So... In terms of this video, all you got to do is replace a college degree with oodles and oodles of cash, which I mean all of us wish we could do at this point. And yeah, you basically got whatever we call this. Now, I'm not saying that this is at all exclusive to POCs. I mean, the whole reason why Trump got in office in the first place, I mean, aside from the blatant bigotry, is him selling his base on how rich he was. Because for some reason, we still have a tendency to try and to quantify aptitude according to wealth, even though we have a metric butt ton of examples to the contrary. But I don't know. It's just something especially irksome about seeing the Oprahs and the murderous Michaels and especially the Steve Potato Heads of the world using life advice, specifically financial advice based on some version of black capitalism in order to build their brands when basically all of the data we have tells us and their own stories even say that their lives are exceptional and not exemplary of the way that that system really works. Furthermore, they and the people who treat their word as gospel treat wealth like some sort of virtue or at least quantifier of it. And Lord knows there are very few grifts easier than telling black people that they can pray their way into prosperity. It's okay, I can use his example. Black Jesus said it's cool. I mean, just from a purely practical standpoint, it's impossible for a single person to control that much wealth and there not be some level of exploitation going on. Whether it's something as subtle as artificially suppressing wages to increase your profit margins or something as overtly sinister as literal slave labor. So the backbone of the tech industry. The revolution starts with refurbishment. Now, listen, I get it. I think I kind of understand why a lot of us still foam at the mouth over seeing brown and black faces on the Fortune 500 and Forbes most wealthy list. But we shouldn't do that. Like, we really should not do that. For one thing, because there's literally no such thing as a self-made man or woman because of things like, oh, I don't know, public education public works, 
public infrastructure. Also, the wealthier you were growing up, the more likely it was that your parents were able to leverage that wealth into you having better quality education opportunities, living standards, and networking opportunities, etc. You are also probably instilled with more frugal spending habits than your average Joe because believe it or not, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to spend money. Like if you don't, it's going to get up and run away because I mean bills duh nigga conversely the poorer you grew up the more likely it is that you benefited from social programs like public housing section 8 snap wick medicaid etc especially if you grew up in an urban area like oh i don't know marcy projects but I'm not really going to waste much time in this video debunking the self-made man slash woman myth because a bunch of other videos have already done it. Videos that you've likely already watched by this point. But I do want to talk about the problem with the black capitalist mythos and how its inextricableness from the entertainment industry is actually better evidence of my point than any amount of black billionaire butthurt sound bites. Now it's like, you know, you know, eat the rich and think, man, we're not stopping. So OK, so before we get to the whole debunking part, we have to actually understand what black capitalism is. See, it's more than just rich niggas being richer than German chocolate cake, but it's really, in a word, self-reliance, or I guess that's two words, but whatever what black capitalists say is that black people shouldn't be satisfied with just being wage workers which i mean you really can't fault that part of the logic can you it goes on further to say that black folks should be striving to become business owners and then they can use that business to hire more blacks and then those blacks would then buy black and then by buying black it would create black communal wealth Logic sounds pretty sound so far, right? Also, at least since I've been alive, there's been a greater push to see more blacks in the corporate world, even though I'm not exactly certain how having more blacks in corporate America would create more communal black wealth. Maybe those blacks would be more apt to hire other blacks into that field, even though that would probably open up the whole reverse racism problem, which is stupid. But Remember, folks, these are the same people that have a problem with affirmative action, even though all of the data we have says that the biggest beneficiaries of AA are actually white women. But hey, what do facts matter when we have pedophiles and talking prunes pushing for reelection? Am I right, guys? Now, to the untrained ear, if this kind of sounds like socialism to you, it's because the logic is kind of the same. An oppressed class seizing the means of production for the purpose of redistributing it to folks who historically have no access to the wealth or the means by which that wealth is created. The problem is when you get to the whole redistribution part. See, nowhere in the black capitalist handbook, which is probably sitting next to Jay-Z's end table right next to Beyonce's diamond studded thong does it say that the black capitalist is obligated to redistribute any of the wealth that they generate back to the community i mean let's keep it a buck folks how much of that renaissance tour revenue do you think beyonce is really giving to the rebuild black wall street fund probably about as much as the cost of a front row ticket which is actually a pretty decent contribution when you think about it. My point is the problem with any form of socially minded capitalism is the whole social part. Regardless of how good your intentions are, at the end of the day, there's still one person controlling the bag. And it's at the discretion of that one person how much, if any, of the bag is going to be redistributed to anyone besides themselves. And a lot of y'all might be sitting there saying, well, it's their money. They shouldn't have to spend it on anything they don't want to anyway. That's fact. Well, first of all, taxes. Second of all, you're actually not wrong, except for the whole fascism part. Please, for the love of God, bread tube, stop using that word. They don't. Steve Harvey can spend as much of his wealth on mustache, wax, and alimony as he wants to, or 
I guess, as much as the court mandates in the case of that last one. But my point is, how does Steve being rich benefit someone like me or any other regular Tom, Dick or Harry? Well, it doesn't. Aside from maybe being a sort of inspirational tale saying that, yeah, if you're willing to sleep in your car for three years and pursue your calling in whatever field that the Lord black Jesus has given you, you too can be disgustingly wealthy by middle age. Except the data tells us, generally speaking, it don't work like that. And that, folks, is the first point of black capitalism that I really want to tackle. And that's using individual achievement as a barometer for collective black wealth. So remember that joke I told in the Blade video about the importance of Obama's presidency being a little overblown in the decade since it's ended? Well, the same rule applies to he and his family being used as virtually the standard for black excellence in our time. I mean... Look at this photo, guys. This is the kind of thing that Booker T. Washington's wet dreams are made of. And if you don't know who that is, why on God's great earth are you watching this video? See, the problem with using Obama as the barometer for collective black achievement is the same as using Obama as the barometer for the political climate, which is exactly what white liberals did in the eight years following his election until old tangerine testes made the most improbable run to the White House ever seen since the kid who became president. And still, Donald is only half as qualified as he is. Believe it or not, despite the increasing number of black million and billionaires in America, the wealth gap is still widening. <laughs> I mean, you didn't think that white folks just stopped being rich once niggas in Paris came out, did you? For reference, in 1992, the percentage of black Americans whose wealth exceeded $1 million was right around 1%. By 2016, that percentage was a little less than 2%. Conversely, the percentage of white Americans whose wealth exceeded $1 million in 92 was 7%. By 2016, that percentage jumped to 15.2%. And I mean, yeah, a million dollars of today's money can't buy you nearly as many NDAs as it would in the early 90s or else Brittany Renner wouldn't be famous. But my point is using the number of black millionaires in existence as a indicator of how far we've come as a people is grossly overestimated. Just like Obama. And just as an interesting little sidebar, when I do use the word billionaire in a vacuum, who are the first people that you think of? Bezos, Zoidberg, Vegas Buffett, Tweet Decker McHair plug. What do all of those folks have in common? They're all not entertainers, obviously. Except Musk, who is basically just Arthur Fleck, except with enough money to con people into laughing at him for the toady factor alone. Now, what if I added a qualifier on there like black billionaire? Who are the first people that you think of? Jay, yay, forehead almighty. What do all of those folks have in common besides substantial amounts of melanation? They're all entertainers, primarily. I mean, even if you want to use people like Oprah, Bob Johnson, Tyler Perry, their wealth came primarily through the entertainment industry in some way, shape, form, or capacity. I mean, even if you want to use Michael Jordan as an example, his billion dollars came primarily because of his glorious bald head and atrocious sense of style being broadcast into our living rooms for the late 80s and duration of the 90s. And that time he spent in D.C. that we don't talk about, just like Bruno. And yeah, there are certain connotations attached to associating black excellence with entertainment, but we can't escape the fact that a disproportionate amount of black elites come from the entertainment industry when compared to white wealth. Let me put it this way. Only 5% of the top 
3.1% of financial elites in America are entertainers. Most of the wealthiest people in the world come from the quote unquote super manager class. So corporate executives and the like. Let me put it this way for greater reference of the Forbes 2022 400 wealthiest in America list. The top 40 controlled one point seven five trillion dollars worth of wealth combined so 44 percent of the entire list and not one of them was a person of color in fact robert f smith you know the guy who pledged to pay off the student loan debt of the entirety of morehouse's 2019 class is the first person who should show up on the list at the 128th spot with his 6.7 billion dollars worth of wealth why he doesn't show up, I don't know, aside from a word that starts with R and ends with ism. Recidivism, obviously. And yeah, for the heck of it, I did go ahead and check to see where Ye and Jay would line up on this list, and they don't. In fact, Queen Wealth herself, Oprah Winfrey, barely makes it with her $2.7 billion, qualifying her for a tie at the 388th spot, which again, why is she not on this list? Also, I did check to see where Rihanna would be on this list, even though her being a citizen of Barbados disqualifies her, and her $1.7 billion also doesn't crack the top 400, but her forehead might. My point is, even among the richest of rich blacks in America, even when their powers combined, it's not even enough to make a few decimal points in the collective wealth of not just this country, but this world's wealthiest wealth hoarders. And for the ones that do, most of them didn't climb the corporate ladder to do so. And frankly, when you look at this list, most of the white folks didn't either. (laughs) And that's a point that I want y'all to bookmark for later, like a Ruby Rose thirst trap. No, I am not ashamed. But again, in a general sense, of course, the most practical method of becoming filthy, stinking rich in this country is securing one of those cushy corporate executive spots, right? Well, surprise, surprise of the S&P Fortune 500 list, only 2.6% of those folk are black. And additionally, only 1% of corporate blacks are even in striking distance of one of those other positions. So as oxymoronic as it sounds, as a black, of course, you actually have a better chance striking it rich getting discovered on soundcloud one day or something then you do accruing tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt getting that business degree that your parents bullied you out of the house into getting and even then your chances are still smaller than puff daddy's teeth reason being that five percent of the point one percent of this country's fiscal elites that are celebrities most of them are white because Duh, nigga. What I'm saying is, if you're black in America, barring some substantial systemic change, you're basically boned. I mean, that is unless you strike gold exaggerating your crack game clout, only to then one day wind up hiring a known DEA informant as the CEO of your media conglomerate. Or alternatively, you can make a living milking 80-year-old church mothers, middle-aged white women, and equal parts desperate and lonely single ladies into mistaking your old man yelling at clouds brand of humor for some kind of folksy wisdom. Or you could always just dress and drag. I'm never going to work in Hollywood, am I? Now, some of y'all might be sitting there saying, but Billiam, just because my odds of becoming a black billionaire are slim to none doesn't mean that we should just throw out the black capitalist baby with the bathwater. That's infanticide. And I mean, yeah, it 
kind of is, but that's aside from the point, which is that the vast majority of folk who are ultra rich are non POCs for a very specific reason. And that's because just like I said earlier, the majority of the ultra wealthy are so because they either inherited it or they were just born into it, which I mean is inheriting it, but whatever moving on my point is it's a lot easier to build off of old money than it is to just create new dollars out of thin air and despite this and probably so black folks have found a way to do just that historically speaking i mean this is despite the dismantling of the freedmen's bureau which if y'all don't know was pretty much kind of a national startup fund for the newly emancipated which ironically enough is the same kind of policy that all of those cuban expats who voted for trump benefited from when they fled castro also the repeal of special order number 15 which is where the whole 40 acres thing comes from which if you didn't know this when that order was repealed there were already a ton of newly emancipated folk who had already settled on the land that had been set aside for them and the feds just came in and kicked them out because Nicks, obviously and also redlining and a bunch of other banking and zoning codes that i'm not going to waste time getting into here but my point is is almost improbably so or actually literally improbably so black folks still found a way to create substantial communal wealth in places like seneca hill and the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, a.k.a. Black Wall Street. I mean, that is until white people got pissed off enough to burn it to the ground or build Central Park over top of it. Remember that the next time you're watching Home Alone 2. So now here we are at the early parts of the mid 20th century where black people are prevented not only by the letter of the actual law, but by the threat of literal physical violence from even attempting anything close to upward socioeconomic mobility. So, no, Steve, the reason why poor people are poor is not because of their sleeping habits but because of laws that were created to keep them that way for no other reason than the color of their skin. And the most frustrating part about it is that people like Steve and Cube and Killer Mike, for that matter, have made something of second careers of themselves, giving advice out to black folks that in some way, shape or form boils down to another sermon on saving a bunch of money that we don't have in order to invest in ventures that we wouldn't be able to afford let alone keep up with anyway and it's frustrating because folks like this i assume they mean well but they're just ill-equipped to give out such advice with such hubris at that for the same reason that you don't see 90 year old church mothers passing out tracks at the local speakeasy anymore They've been removed from that life for so long that they no longer speak the language of the people from whence they come. Kind of like Jake Sully. Don't cap, you know you watched Avatar. Because let's keep it a buck, folks. For as much as Steve loves to tell that story about he being homeless for three years in order to pursue his career in comedy, let's not forget that he left some pretty well-paying jobs in order to do that. And also, this was the early 90s. This is how much the wealth gap has increased from rich to poor since then. Also, it bears mentioning that the main reason why he was so poor is because 75% of his income was going to his then estranged first wife. But hey, I guess that doesn't make for as inspirational a soundbite for his morning radio show. Now, does it? They said he never gave you niggas money. From the time that I was a wee lad, I've been hearing this point being espoused by everyone in my family from the diet hoteps with the Ankh tattoos on their forehead like some kind of BHI Ash Wednesday to the members of my family who would most definitely be grand old partiers if they weren't, you know, 
the color of a paper bag. And that's that the key to unlocking communal black wealth is for us to simply buy and bank black. I mean, we do control more than one trillion dollars in spending power. And see, that right there is the issue, folks. This point sounds good in a vacuum, except actually it doesn't sound good even in that context. Just like everything else hoteps believe. Sorry, auntie. See, black capitalist talking points are kind of like... The Brooklyn Nets, circa 2021 to 23. How, you may ask? Well, because separately they're irksome enough, but when their powers combine, they are utterly insufferable. How, you may ask? Well, they're equal parts obnoxious and self-assured, despite never doing anything of substance together besides hijacking and derailing an otherwise productive and healthy culture only to then chunk the deuces when the water got too hot. Am I still talking about black capitalists? Hell, I don't know. Just move on to the next point. So back to that spending power point, which if you ask me is the Kyrie of the bunch just for how wrong it is. But more than just how wrong it is, it irks me because so many people cite it as a reputable point because either they don't know better or if we're just going to keep it a buck, they're too lazy to do the legwork and really find out where that information is coming from. Otherwise, they realize it's bunk to begin with. So, yeah, just like Kyrie. See, here's the problem with this point, aside from there not really being a real way for us to substantiate it unless we, like, try to complete data to make our point, which is exactly how we got this point to begin with. Spending power does not equate directly to wealth. I mean, if you don't believe me, just ask all of those Section 8 residents who bought Renaissance tickets with a Klarna or a firm loan. See, most of that one or two or however many trillions of dollars is supposed to be now is already tied up into things like rent, mortgage, utilities. You know, the things that you need to keep a roof over your head. Also, everyday items like gas, groceries, anal beads, you know, the necessities. And whatever you have left over after you spent all of that is how wealthy you are, which let's keep it a buck for most of us ain't that much. And that's why 70 percent of the average American's wealth is directly correlated to the value of their primary residence. My point is that trillions of dollars of spending power mark is just a marketing gimmick used by corporate capitalists to get you to spend money that you don't really have to make them richer. Well, I mean, some of them are probably black, so I guess it's all a wash. And this isn't even to mention debt, by the way. Did you know that the average black degree holder owes $52,000 in student loan debt? which is $25,000 more than the average white borrower. Additionally, black degree holders report on average owing 12.5% more in student loan debt four years out from graduation than they did on commencement day. This is due to a number of factors, including many black folks, women especially, believing that it's necessary for them to attain an advanced degree in order to overqualify themselves against peers who are non-black and or non-female. And I mean, when you look at this, where to lie at? But also the fact that black college students typically come from lower income backgrounds than their white peers. For reference, a black degree holder can expect to make $30,000 a year more on average than a white with a high school diploma, again, generally speaking. However, that same black can expect to make $20,000 a year less than a white with comparable education. What I'm saying is, even if Johnny and Jalil grew up in the same zip code, 
went to the same schools and even went to the same college or grew up on the same block for that matter, chances are Jalil is probably going to have a much harder time financing his degree without a Pell Grant or pole dancing lessons. And while we're here, let's just go ahead and dispel the whole model minority myth that people like Enos Freedom have managed to make a second career out of because they suck so badly at their original profession. Yeah, while Asian American households at face value are the most wealthy and educated POCs in this country, once you look past the surface hype, the narrative kind of falls apart just like the 2023 Brooklyn Nets. According to the Pew Research Center, Asian American households average about $85,000 a year annually, with 54% of those households having at least one degree holder. However, only Sri Lankans, Filipinos, and Indians make on average more than that $85,000 mark a year, with Indians coming in at a whopping $127,000 a year. In fact, according According to the Pew Research Center, Asian Americans are the most disparate ethnic group when it comes to economic strength, with the top 10% making, on average, 10.7 times more than the bottom 10th percentile a year. My point being that whole model minority myth is faker than George Washington's front teeth or a Brooklyn Nets championship run. But while we're here, let's go ahead and debunk another black capitalist point that's not nearly as prominent as the first one, but it is equally as irksome if for different reasoning, and that being the black dollar circulation myth. I call this one the Ben Simmons of the group. Why? Well, because in a vacuum, everyone knows that it's pretty much worthless alone. But when coupled with more heralded and celebrated points, it does have the potential to contribute some value. At least that's what folks think until they're inevitably disappointed by how little it actually does with that potential. Tapping his way in. Spins on Gallinari. Gives it up. Oh, he was right there. And a foul as Thibel goes to the basket. I will never forgive you for this, Ben. You know you've heard it before, the black dollar only circulates in community for 24, 12, 2, however many hours it's supposed to be. And this is always juxtaposed to communities like Asian Americans and especially Jews. And yeah, that's not problematic at all. I mean, aside from how blatantly racist it is, what makes this point problematic is that, again, it can't be substantiated, even more so than that spending power mark that I talked about earlier. So much and so that a nonprofit organization called Truth Be Told ran out of Howard University's communications and journalism department took the necessary steps to try and to track down where this figure came because I hate to break it to you folks. Nobody keeps that kind of data. <laughs> In fact, when truth be told, tried to track down exactly where this figure came from, they wound up at surprise, surprise, a black wealth building guy from 1996 by author Brooke Stevens, who said that she got the figure from a guy named Lee Green, who ironically enough, allegedly was employed by Howard University at some point, despite, you know, Howard having no record of anybody by that name working for them in any capacity, set maybe as a custodian. So now, folks, we can get to the main event, and that's debunking the Kevin Durant of the group, and that is the Just Buy Black myth. Why is this one reserved for Kevin? Well, because by itself, it's actually got some pretty decent merit to it except again when it's done in isolation hasn't really done much of note besides piss a bunch of other people off by how thin-skinned and 
even more thinly scalped it is. First of all, it should be more obvious than the reason why your biggest OnlyFans contributor bought a plane ticket for you to his city for y'all to hang out that black folks face a disparate amount of obstacles when even attempting to start a business. The main one being the lack of start up most of us have to start a business. First of all, black people just don't have the same kind of credential clout that their white peers do because black, duh, genius. This is why, according to a 2016 Fed small business report, 58% of black owned businesses reported experiencing some level of difficulty acquiring business credit as opposed to 32% of their white peers. Additionally, according to a 2019 Atlanta Fed report, despite black folks having the highest self-reported revenue growth expectation, they were also significantly less likely to receive business credit than their white peers. All of that aside, though, even if every black entrepreneur aspiring or otherwise did get the kind of funding they were seeking, there simply aren't enough of them to make a significant dent in the wealth gap. For reference, 71 percent of American businesses are white owned compared to the 9.5 percent that are black and the 12.2 percent that are Latino. However, those white owned businesses control 88 percent of overall sales and 86.5 of employment, leaving blacks with only 1.9 percent of sales and 1.7 percent of employment and Latinos with 4 percent of sales and 4.2 percent of employment. What this means is in order for POC owned businesses to be represented proportionately to our distribution of the workforce, we would need to create 1.1 million new POC owned businesses that employ 9 million people and that generate $300 billion worth of worker income. And see, that's the catch right there, folks. That Fugazi LLC that you use to apply for that PPP loan a few years ago, that doesn't count. You got to be a business that employs at least one other person at a reasonable wage aside from the owner, which, again, you need startup capital to do that if you're first starting out. I mean, unless you got kids and I mean, there are laws against that, but it never stopped Bob Belcher now, did it? or my dad for that matter, which is why I started playing football four years too late for it to matter. Still waiting on that check, bucko. 67% of firms that don't employ anyone but the owner generate less than $25,000 a year. And again, if you're the owner of this business and that is your sole source of income, you're pretty much living in poverty. So my point is, who is this business's very existence benefiting anyway? And that's about as good a defense as you're going to get when your PPP fraud trial begins. Even with all that being said, business ownership doesn't necessarily close the wealth gap between POCs and whites because on average, those businesses are not valued as much as white owned firms for a variety of reasons. But including the fact that those businesses are more likely to actually employ someone other than the owner, which means they're more likely to generate respectable sales, which means that the owner can actually afford to eat dinner every now and again. Again, the reason for all of this is because white men who, surprise, surprise, represent a disproportionate amount of business owners are just born into a situation where they're just gifted the startup needed to get off the ground, which need I remind y'all is the reason most businesses fail in the first place. They don't have enough money at jump to sustain them through that awkward. Ah, I don't really know what I'm doing phase until they can make a profit which might take as much as half a decade to do. And no, it's not just the Andy Sandbergs and the Jeff Luthors of the world either. According to a 2010 study conducted by the Minority Owned Business Development Association, the average white owned firm started out with $106,000 of capital, while the average BOB started out with a little over 35,000. Again, Unless you're selling blow or booty, you're pretty much getting up to be let down. Now, with all of that aside, realistically speaking, 
black owned businesses just aren't equipped to compete directly with white owned firms. For reference, Walmart, the largest private employer in America, employs 2.2 million more employees than the top 100 black owned businesses combined and generates more revenue than all 2.58 million black owned businesses put together. My point is we can't just buy our way out of bondage. It doesn't work that way. No matter what killer Mike or Doughboy has to say. Hold on, wait a minute. Thought I was finished. But Billiam, I hear you saying as you clutch your copy of Sean the Rhymes' this year of yes close to your chest. What about banking black? Well, didn't you hear what I just said about black owned businesses? Why would you think any of that would change just because the last B in Bob has changed from business to bank? For reference, JP Morgan and Chase controls $2 trillion worth of assets alone. The top five black owned banks control $2.3 billion combined, which I mean, maybe enough to cover the collective BBL bills for Fulton and DeKalb counties, but it's not nearly enough for black folks to compete directly with white wealth because again, it was robbed from us at jump. I mean, let's just go back to that one4 trillion whatever amount of spending power we're supposed to have still that's a little over only half the amount that is controlled by jp morgan chase alone like do you truly believe that we have enough money to compete directly with white wealth hoarding with the state that we're in now i mean if you believe that then you probably heard it from a celebrity in which case you probably also trust a man with three failed marriages to give you relationship advice so yeah there you have that but billiam what about financial literacy what about personal responsibility what about hashtag mamba mentality hustle grind time mindset the problem isn't literal centuries of bad fiscal policy designed to keep black people in a perpetual state of disenfranchisement for just being black, but it's men who think it's okay to have locks longer than their wives and who don't know how to fix a catalytic converter. Or it's women who don't wear makeup and wear baggy pants because they secretly want to be a man, but still want to be treated like a lady. Or it's giving up the D and or P during the first week of the relationship because evidently sex is about power and not pleasure. And I swear to God, I am so sick to death of this same anti-black gender war bull <laughs> being grifted by small-minded people who think that equally small-minded people parroting it makes it make sense. As a man, like, women should worship me. You feel me? Man. Are you married by chance? Nah, man, I ain't never had a girlfriend. Okay. But what I'm saying- A study conducted by the St. Louis Fed in 2017 concluded that, quote, meager economic circumstances, not poor decision-making or deficit knowledge, constrain choices and leave asset poor borrowers with little to no other option but to use predatory and abusive alternative financial services. Like, for example, buy here, pay here, car loans. And I mean, I grew up on a block with like five different used car dealerships. So I'm speaking from experience. You want to know the real reason why the wealth gap exists and just keeps getting larger and larger by the day? It's the same one you think it is. Yeah, the one that your buddies on Twitter who keep sharing Killer Mike clips to con you into buying crypto or trying to convince you is not as big a deal as it actually is. It is estimated that in the 246 years of chattel slavery in North America, blacks were robbed of anywhere between 24 and 97 trillion dollars in wealth. Free labor that this country literally would not exist without. 
And I really don't feel like arguing with niggas in the comments about how you growing up in some hick town in West Virginia that still uses kerosene and outhouses disqualifies you from being a benefactor of chattel slavery. I'm just going to link this video I did last year and this article by people much smarter than me that says you're full of bull defecate. But I will say that this is the primary reason for the racial wealth yet. And not much has been done to rectify it. And according to polls, only about one in three of America American leftists, right wing and otherwise actually care enough to do anything to address it or at least the one thing that we all know will address it substantially. In addition to slavery, we have to talk about the mismanagement of the Freedmen's Savings Bank. Another failed initiative, just like the Freedmen's Bureau and Special Field Order 15 that only failed because of micro dicked white men. The bank was marketed as a means of wealth generation for newly freed black folks who would generate interest on any amount of money they deposited over one dollar. Even Frederick Douglass, the bank's president at one point, deposited ten thousand dollars of his own money to help the bank get off the ground before quickly resigning. Why did he resign, you ask? Well, because the all white, all male executive board of the bank invested the money in a number of high risk, highly ill advised ventures and wound up losing almost all of it because. Gosh. In fact, nine years after the bank was established, it closed its doors, costing its depositors more than three million dollars of lost money. $82 million in today's money. Now, to be fair, the feds did set up a program where depositors could recover up to 62 cents for every dollar they lost. But surprise, surprise, for the third time in this video, most were never able to recover because Negroes. Fred himself said that the bank's failure was the worst thing to happen to black America since slavery and before Twitter, obviously. And I haven't even mentioned the Homestead Act, the Social Security Act or the GI Bill, all of which largely, if not completely excluded black folks from reaping their benefits. My point is black capitalism never was and never will be the solution to our collective condition, because believe it or not, black Wall Street, as heralded as it has been, deservedly so, was not completely self-sustaining. Another thing that I'm not going to waste time getting into in today's video, but you can look it up for yourself. I mean, black Black capitalism is pretty much just Reaganomics written in Ebonics, and it fails every single time for the same reason that Reaganomics did. It's the same reason why student loan payments have been deferred for perpetuity now and the same reason why you got that sweet stimulus check a few years ago and that's that rich people don't spend the money that you give them they just hoard it but working and poor people spend money which drives the economy and the reason why we spend money is because you gotta spend to eat and you gotta eat to live bucko so why would any of that change just because the color of the capitalist does well, like I've been saying for this entire video, it does it. Like practically speaking, it's impossible to control that much wealth as one person without some degree of exploitation going on directly because of you making that much money. That Fenty bra and panty set of yours that you got for Valentine's Day, yeah, some woman in a sweatshop in Southeast Asia who gets paid like a nickel and a Pepsi a day is responsible for making that. Those Yeezy slides that you're so proud of that look like something off of a JRPG armor set. Yeah, some kid in China who probably has a machete up to his neck right now is responsible for making that as well. The bulk of Jay-Z's economic empire has been created due in no small part to his shady business dealings and this folks in a lot of ways brings us full circle to the point i made earlier about the inextricableness of black capitalism from the entertainment industry for all the acclaim that black elites receive from the community for being elite what have they really done to offset the plight that the vast majority of black americans face 
Okay, Jigga did launch Reform Alliance alongside Meek Mill, and he did call the governor of Minnesota that one time, and he and his bootylicious bay did give millions of dollars to protesters over the years. But he's also proven time and again that profit is his only real politic, just like most entertainers. Por ejemplo, in 2017, Jigga the Bigger Figure partnered with Barney's to create a fashion line that included a $58,000 crocodile jacket that I'm not going to cap. If I could afford, would be the highlight of my Sunday Best Ensemble. However, after calls for him to break his contract with Barney's over its documented history of profiling black customers, Jay opted to instead donate 100% of the money generated from that line to charity. Which, I mean, come on, y'all know that that was a little more than a tax write-off for him at the end of the day and then there's the aforementioned barclays deal if i did mention it i don't really remember at this point that was able to gain clout in the community in which it was built largely because of jay's name recognition but when the dollars no longer made sense enough for him to stand pat he pulled out and left a gentrified cream pie behind and didn't even have the decency to lay down a towel first this isn't even to mention the plethora of rumors circulating about his penchant to leave homies of yesteryear hanging high and dry when they're of no more use to him. What I'm saying is the great men narrative used to prop up the black capitalist narrative just doesn't compute. Because even if these folks pump 100% of their wealth back into the community, it's still not good enough. And a part of them, I think, knows this. But they use that narrative to make themselves feel better about the fact that the community is the reason they got to where they are in the first place. Okay, so y'all can kind of tell by the flow of this video that i wasn't really going to focus too much on any one black capitalist because one they're all pretty much the same nigga and b highlighting the shady business practices of individual billionaires is practically a subgenre of youtube commentary unto itself now and the only reason i even mentioned jay specifically was because of how those two acts specifically are the easiest examples i could think of of how contradictory black billionaires are well, I'm sorry, y'all. I got to come for Rihanna specifically. Not because I have anything against her personally. I mean, besides her giving Big Red and EB extra time to scheme adjustments for the second half of the Super Bowl that they wouldn't have had the time to do if not for that mid-ass halftime show. But I'm going to keep it a buck with y'all. I thought that all of us anywhere left of Elon ejaculate swallowers were kind of on the same page when it came to the billionaire class. But like for real, what the actual F is this? Like I know y'all are a beauty blog primarily, but y'all really should know better than this. Matter of fact, y'all being a beauty blog, y'all should be the main ones blowing the trumpet in defiance of the benevolent billionaire princess image that Rihanna and her PR team have crafted over the years. Okay, so like most people I mentioned earlier, Rihanna's journey to ultra wealth began in entertainment. But like yay before her, Rihanna didn't even come close to crossing the billionaire threshold until she branched out into other avenues, specifically beauty and fashion. The beauty industry is just as, if not more, notorious than tech and fashion when it comes to human rights violations. For reference, Fenty beauty products use a mineral called mica, the vast majority of which is found in India, the vast majority of which is produced by unregulated mines in India, the vast majority of which are produced by unregulated mines in India that utilize child laborers who get paid anywhere between 29 and 42 U.S. cents a day while working in extremely hazardous conditions. And if any of this sounds like deja vu to you, then congratulations. You probably watched that video I did about Musk a while back. Here, have a cookie for your efforts. In 2021, Vinya Josi of the NGO National Rights Observatory filed a complaint with the National Commission for the Protection of Children alleging that Fenty was using mica produced by mines where, quote, child laborers work in dire conditions. A spokesperson for Fenty said that the company does not personally audit its suppliers, but, quote, expects its direct product suppliers to adhere to and to implement our supplier's code of conduct. So, yeah, basically, this is a textbook case of passing the buck. And 
nigga, like, I, I had to have done, like, two or three videos telling y'all that this is social capitalism 101 by now. But, I mean, if we really going to keep it a buck, it really don't matter how many videos I or anybody else do on it because stands, man. Stans are the most willfully stupid people on the planet. Like, Rihanna could literally walk out on stage and sacrifice a baby to an effigy of Dagon, and I guarantee it'll start an entire discourse on Twitter about postpartum abortion rights. And y'all think I'm joking, but Feet literally made a whole video about y'all, and y'all called him a Nazi for it. And you know why? Because y'all are such simps for streamers that you don't know the difference between actual fascism and just checking niggas for saying stuff online that would probably get their fronts busted in real life. Yeah, I said it, nigga. And don't worry, I got plenty of slugs in the clip if you're feeling froggy. In order for capitalism to work, at least on the scale that we have it now, you have to have a class of haves and a class of have-nots a class of exploiters and a class of folk being exploited. And I hate to break it to you folks, whenever there's exploitation going on, people of color are always disproportionately impacted by that. So it doesn't matter how Hotep Kanye is or is not. And it doesn't matter how many plus size body positive lingerie sets Rihanna produces. At the end of the day, even if inadvertently, their wealth hoarding brings harm directly to the people that they're supposed to be examples for. So the question you probably have now is, well, smart guy, how do you propose we fix the system? Well, honestly, I don't have any proposals for y'all. I'm not going to waste my time trying to figure out a solution to this problem. That's what y'all got St. Andrew for. But my point is to say, for the love of black Jesus, can y'all please stop letting Steve Harvey tell you that the reason you're poor is because you haven't prayed hard enough? I mean, if that were the way that it really worked, then I can guarantee you that Lori would be Steve's favorite son.